everyone, welcome to this webinar on the value of the arts. Um, my name is Ben Wormsley. I'm the uh, director of the Centre for Cultural Value, which is hosted here at the University of Leeds. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to lots of alumni from the University of Leeds. So thank you for coming along this afternoon, this evening, depending where you are, this morning maybe. Uh, we're really looking forward to the next hour or so of sharing some of our thoughts about cultural value and the role that arts and culture play in society. Um, thank you for the questions that some of you have asked in advance, which are pretty challenging, but we're looking forward to debating and discussing some of those key questions that you have. But please do um, uh, keep your questions coming all the way through the session. The, there are three speakers who I'll introduce in turn, um, but please do post questions in the Q&A function uh, and I'll do my best as chair to keep my eye on the questions and we'll have uh, hopefully half an hour at the end to have a really good discussion and do our best to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so I'm going to start off and just give you an introduction to the Centre for Cultural Value. Um, talk a little bit about our history uh, and where we came from um, and about our core values and uh, our, our mission, what we're trying to achieve over the next few years. So the history, uh, we really the centre, the idea behind the centre came from a huge body of research that was conducted in kind of 2013, 2014, called the AHRC Cultural Value Project. Um, and that comprised around 70 different projects that looked at different aspects of how arts and culture play a vital role in society. Um, and the aim of the project really, the kind of overarching goal was to encourage researchers to think about the first hand experience of audiences and participants for arts, culture and heritage and screen. Um, so really interested in the audience voice rather than making assumptions about audiences. Um, and the second kind of um, challenge, I guess, for researchers was to really think about creative methods. So how can we really understand how people engage with culture and the benefits that they incur from their, their engagement with arts and culture? So, for example, some of the projects were looked at biometric research or artists working as researchers, um, creative workshops, graffiti, etc. So really trying to be quite pioneering and innovative in the methodologies used to understand the benefits of cultural engagement. Um, and at the end of the report, there was a call or recommendation, really, to create a new national research centre. Um, we applied for that. We were fortunate enough to be awarded that through a very competitive um, process. So in October 2019, we launched as the National Centre for Cultural Value based at the University of Leeds. So we're funded um, over five years in the initial instance to about two and a half million pounds. So uh, what are we here for? Well, our goal is to work with uh, the cultural sector, with policymakers and with academics to build a shared understanding of the differences that arts, culture, heritage and screen make to people's lives and more broadly to society. Um, cultural value obviously is a, is a tricky term. It's a very knotty concept. And what we didn't want to do was to spend five years just really thinking about what is cultural value and have a kind of academic debate about that. Um, there have been centuries of debate, of course, about what is academic value and what is cultural value and who decides. So what we wanted to do was to do something quite pragmatic to really try and make a difference. Um, and ultimately our goal is that cultural policy and cultural practice is based on a rigorous research and evidence base of what works and what needs to change. Uh, so we have a number of core partners, including, of course, the audience agency. So Anne Torregiani will be speaking uh, later on this evening about uh, her role as co-director. So we work with um, cultural sector partners and then with a range of universities from across the UK. And maybe just worth saying that we have a, a fully UK wide remit, so we work as much as we can 
uh, easier these days, I guess, when everything, most things are watched online. Uh, but we do work across the four nations of the UK. Um, and one of our challenges, I guess, is to, is to really speak to differences, certainly in policy, but also in practice, um, you know, to different political parties, different kinds of flavour of government across the four UK nations. And um, so we, to be truly useful and meaningful to those four nations is something that we strive to do, but uh, I would say not always fully succeed yet. Uh, we funded by three different funders, so an academic funder, uh, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, Paul Hamlin Foundation and Arts Council England. We work very much in partnership. We're a tiny team of about four full-time equivalent members of the staff. Um, so we have to be pretty flexible and nimble. Um, so our, our model very much is to be a network of networks and to broker and work in, in partnership and collaboration in almost everything that we do. So you can see here the range of partners from, again, across the UK that we work with. Um, and our affiliate partners, I guess, fall into three types. So we have national cultural organisations like um, the BBC or the National Theatre of Scotland, for example. We have membership organisations here like the Museums Association or One Dance UK, who give us uh, easier access, kind of gatekeepers, I guess, to their member networks. And then we have what we call delivery partners. So people like Tate, for example, we're about to start a collaborative PhD with uh, in October looking at the future of the digital museum post COVID. So what kind of role can digital engagement play with online audiences? Um, our ethos, uh, this, is, this is key, I think. One of the first things we debated and discussed when we're thinking about what cultural value meant in practice um, was that we have to take a very plural approach. You know, there is of course not one kind of cultural value. So we st our starting point is very much, you know, from a recognition that there are diverse perspectives around culture and cultural values. Probably everyone you ask about cultural value will give you a very different answer, um, which makes our work interesting. It's never, it's never dull, certainly, at the centre for cultural value. But we believe fundamentally that everybody values culture of some kind or another, whether that's um, graffiti or rap or opera or ballet, even if, and perhaps especially when in the current context, they don't always have equal opportunities to take part in the activities they value most. So our aim always is to reflect the diversity of, um, of the population really. And we're aware that core audiences for arts and culture are really unrepresentative of that wider population. And it's something we're working with partners to address as much as we can. So uh, our business model, where do, we, where do we hope to add value? Um, uh, we, we really try and work at the intersection of three key stakeholder groups, I guess. So the first of those is the cultural sector itself. So trying to make research as relevant as possible as we can uh, for the cultural sector. Uh, the second group is cultural policy makers. So to try and ensure that everything we do uh, is useful again to policymakers. So we have our research has impact. It translates into change in the real world and makes things better for people. Um, and academic researchers, we work with academics to bring them into the center to to um, bring expert voices, diverse voices in to help make people's research uh, disseminated more widely and to make it as accessible as we can to the different stakeholder groups. And our activity really, again, falls into three main areas. So first of all, research. So we, we undertake our own research. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But at the moment, we're doing a, a huge project looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the UK's cultural sector. Um, but we also fund and commission research from cultural organisations. Um, but our main job, and something that Robin does, I'm going to introduce uh, shortly, is to, is to synthesize and scope all of the research that's out there uh, and to make it as appealing, engaging, accessible as possible to uh, the cultural sector and to policymakers. So we do that with via podcasts, via 
research digests, via how-to guides, via case studies, for example. Uh, the second bit of our work is evaluation. Um, so Anne Tarajani has been leading the development of a set of uh, co-developed evaluation principles. So trying to upskill the cultural sector so we can communicate with as much rigor and credibility as possible the power of arts and cultural engagement. And finally, policy, trying to work with policymakers, as I say, not just across the UK, but globally, um, to really have some of those difficult discussions about evidence we have of what works in terms of culture funding and what needs to change. You know, where are the gaps in funding? So a lot of our time at the moment is spent talking to, say, DCMS or the culture teams in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So research, um, I'll just quickly summarize this. You can see here our core themes over the next, uh, well, the whole five year period. So we're currently uh, engaged in the project looking at the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and we're currently towards the end of our first core theme, which is culture, health, and well-being. So something that Robin is gonna talk about shortly. Uh, next year, we're going to focus very much on cultural participation. So looking at, everyday creativity, uh, digital engagement, uh, lifelong learning, for example. And our third core theme is this idea of community, place and identity, something that Anne's going to talk about at the end of this presentation. Um, evaluation, as I said, we've uh, worked with uh, 46 um, experts in evaluation over the past year and co-created this set of principles, which tries to really define what evaluation is, who it's for, what kind of methods and approaches should be used, whose voices should be amplified. Um, and in the next few years, we're going to develop some of that work through case studies into uh, a MOOC, a massive open online course that will be free for anyone who wants to engage with it. So those of you interested in questions of cultural evaluation, please do keep in touch and we'll uh, be sending out information about that in the next year or so as we develop that MOOC. And finally, policy. Um, our aim here is ultimately to place culture at the heart of local, regional and national policy making. So I, I know some of your questions were very much about policy, about planning, for example. Um, we know this is an aspirational goal that culture doesn't always have a seat at the top table, but it's something that we're really trying to address by sharing by disseminating by building relationships with all kinds of local regional national policy makers including um the the metro mayors for example in england at the moment um, and to really build this evidence base so we're not just advocating for culture we're finding really rigorous um research and evaluation that proves and demonstrates the value that arts and culture can have beyond all reasonable doubt um, just quickly, I mentioned the COVID-19 project, um, again, something we're working with the audience agency on, as well as the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre. This work is, is a huge 15-month uh, project involving uh, case studies with cultural organisations, a lot of quantitative analysis of the impact on the workforce, for example, showing how um, COVID has exacerbated inequalities. Uh, and reduced the already poor diversity of the cultural labour force. Uh, we're doing an ecosystem analysis of Greater Manchester um, and a social media analysis as well, as well as developing a online platform. And then the audience agency are undertaking a citizens panel over 15 months looking at changing attitudes and behaviours towards cultural engagement across the UK. So uh, just to finish a snapshot of what we've done, um, we mainly host online events at the moment. So we've hosted 18 events, including um, a one week, uh, two week actually, two week festival that we held last year. We're about to hold a two day conference based on our COVID-19 research. Uh, we have newsletters. So again, please do sign up if you're interested to our newsletters. We have over 3000 subscribers already. We're very active on Twitter with nearly 5,000 followers. So again, if you're on Twitter, please do give us a follow and engage in some discussion, maybe uh, live as we're, as we're progressing through the next uh, 40 minutes or so. 
Um, we produce lots of different resources, as I've said, research digest, short films, podcasts, um, and we've published articles and blogs. So we'll have a link hopefully in the chat where you can access our Culture Hive platform. And here, just to give you a visual flavour of some of the um, outputs that we produce, the webinars, the, the, the research digest, the short films, the webinars, the festivals, etc. Again, all really welcome to come along to those events over the next few months and years. And please do stay in touch with us. So hopefully that's given you a, a very brief overview of some of the things that we do, our core activity. Um, just a reminder to please do post any questions in the chat as we go along, and I will come to those at the end. But now I'm going to hand over to our full-time postdoc researcher, Robin uh, Dowlin, who uh, has a PhD in Arts and Health. And Robin's going to talk to you a little bit more about the specific work we've been doing over the past um, two years, really, in the area of culture, health and well-being. Hello everyone. Um, so I'm Robin um, and I'm a postdoc researcher at the centre um, and I'm going to talk you through some of the work that we've been doing around understanding the value of culture for our health and well-being um, and the challenges that may come in hand um, with trying to communicate and convey this value to the really broad range of, of stakeholders represented in this in this field. So a bit of something interactive to start with take 30 seconds um, can you think of a time when engaging with arts and culture had a positive impact on your health or your well-being and if you're happy to share this pop that in the chat and I can read a couple of them out but just an example from me um, I really valued um, music and singing um, during lockdown periods uh, keeping me happy and um, feeling less socially isolated during those times Just give you a few more seconds to pop anything in the chat but no worries if there's nothing you can think of at the moment silly improvisation based on film to make our family laugh i love that idea lots of laughter and joy there amazing so arts and craft oh can't think of a time when it hasn't These all sound um, fantastic, but feel free to keep putting them in the chat and that will help us to kind of see the really wide range um, of value that, that people see in terms of health and well-being. So over the past decade, the field of culture, health and well-being has really blossomed. And there's some incredible cultural organisations who are working with a really wide range of people to address different health and well-being needs. So, for example, Company Chameleon, based in Manchester, who support young people's mental health through dance. Clod Ensembles, performing medicine programme that helps healthcare professionals to develop empathetic practice and learn nonverbal communication skills. Um, and Aesop's Dance to Health programme, which has been shown to reduce falls and fall risks for older people. And with this, there's also been significant interest in these programmes from researchers and policymakers. And these are just a snapshot of all the publications that have been coming out um, in the last five to 10 years. So with all this interest, where are the challenges? Um, and I'm going to use the value of music programmes for people living with dementia as an example. So before joining um, the centre, I was doing my PhD research, which focused on understanding the benefits of music for people living with dementia. Um, and whenever I talk to people about the role that music plays in the lives of people living with dementia, it almost always strikes a chord. Um, whether this is stories about um, sitting together with a relative and listening to music that takes them back to their young adulthood, dancing to wedding songs, singing in a choir and performing to audiences like in BBC's Dementia Choir a couple of years ago. 
there's something about music that really speaks to people living with dementia but would it surprise you that it's actually really challenging to build an evidence base for the use of music with people living with dementia even though we have all of these really powerful personal stories So why is it challenging to understand value in this particular context? Well, there are a number of reasons, and these three probably only scratch the surface. But one reason is the way in which music is framed within the context of dementia. So research in this area is dominated by biomedical approaches, which means that the benefits of music are only seen as valuable if they're shown to reduce symptoms of dementia, such as agitation, depression or anxiety. And the way this is measured is by conducting an assessment of these symptoms before and after music, which means that we miss all those kind of interactions that happen with a person in the moment when they're engaging with music. And this also ties into this idea that different stakeholders expect different outcomes. A health professional may expect to see significant changes in these types of outcomes to say with confidence that music makes a difference. Whereas a musician may look to see how music allows people living with dementia to form connections with other people and be more creative. And then finally, people living with dementia can't always articulate their experiences verbally. So we have to think outside of the box when it comes to understanding the personal significance and not just relying on other people to, to kind of report on their behalf. So the next couple of slides are just an illustration of the real differences when it comes to communicating value to different stakeholders. So in a health context, a researcher may seek to understand the impacts of music on a wide range of outcomes, including those listed on the slide. And this approach is more about um, using arts and culture as a means to improve or manage symptoms of dementia. And to date, this approach has really yielded conflicting evidence with some pointing to small changes in these symptoms and others seeing no improvements at all. Um, and on the left is a Cochrane review. And these reviews bring together all of the research in a given area to understand what the current state of the evidence is. Um, and they've only been able to conclude that music might make a difference to levels of depression, but there's no evidence that it impacts on social connectivity, which is kind of counter to what we see in these personal stories. So this contrasts very strongly with outcomes that are valued by those working within culture, health and wellbeing contexts. And my PhD was actually funded because of a question that came out of the cultural sector from the organization Manchester Camerata. And they were finding that they really struggled to convey value in terms of symptom reduction or reduction in use of antipsychotic medication. But it was actually the in the moment experiences that really mattered. Um, and so I came along and sought to understand what these in the moment experiences looked like and the value of these experiences for people living with dementia themselves. So as you can see, the outcomes in this context are much more centered around finding meaning and fulfillment in life being creative, developing new skills, having fun. This strikes a chord with some of the things that have come up in the chat. And although these things are personally meaningful to people living with dementia and their family members, they may not be seen as rigorous enough compared to these more health-based outcomes. And this is a tricky situation that's not unique to the context of music and dementia. So at the centre, I'm heading up a range of research reviews um, which look at different themes that fall under the umbrella of culture, health and wellbeing. So we've done a review on cultural programmes that are prescribed by medical professionals, the use of cultural programmes in the training and development of healthcare students, young people's mental health and older people's physical health. And we're finding that no matter the topic, the art and culture is pushed to one side in favour of reporting health based outcomes. And this creates a real challenge because we don't know enough about what happens when people are engaging with arts and cultural experiences and how this actually relates to these health based outcomes. And we can't create a strong evidence base in this area without rebalancing the scales here a bit more. Secondly, the work being done on the ground by cultural organisations and practitioners is vital within this context, and yet they're rarely acknowledged in the research literature. Artists are dealing with increasingly challenging and complex mental and physical health needs for those who they are working with. 
and they receive very little training and very little support for their own development and well-being. The artists that I've talked to are feeling stressed and burnt out um, and they're always going above and beyond to support those who need it most. Thirdly, the quality of the uh, evidence that's out there is not a very high standard at the moment. Um, and there's a real need to invest in research. It's really going to get to the bottom of why the value of, of, of both value and both process and outcome, if we're going to move forwards. The current funding landscape only allows for these kind of short term research projects that focus on small programs, meaning that we see a lot of pilot programs that aren't developed substantially. And this means there's a real lack of longitudinal work. Um, and this is an issue because participants take part in activities for 10 weeks at a time on average. And there's some research to suggest that well-being can actually decrease at the end of programmes because people are not going to be able to continue accessing these programmes on a more permanent basis. There's a need for more sustainable models of funding to ensure people who take part don't feel abandoned at the end of a programme. So where do we go from here? Go back one slide. Oh no. Sorry, I'm not quite sure <laughs> what's happened here. Um, but what's really important is this idea of uh, partnerships um, and building a shared narrative of what value means in this context. Um, we need to be able to center the on the experiences of people um, and how these programs take have a direct impact on people's lives. Secondly, we need to be able to build more sustainable research practices within this area and develop the talent pipeline to, to actually lead to innovation. There's a lot of research in this area that just hasn't developed over the past 10 years. And we can't expect this area to move forwards without significant investment in this topic area and supporting a, div a diverse range of new voices. Um, and we also need to ensure that research is inclusive and empowering because many of the people who benefit from arts and cultural experiences when it comes to their health and well-being are disempowered through structural and health inequalities. Research should be done with people rather than on people to ensure the evidence on people's experiences rather than simply on outcomes that are wanted by funders. And it's only through these things that methodological innovation and greater policy engagement can happen, which we hope in turn will be able to lead to us being able to more clearly convey and communicate the value of culture for our health and well-being. So thank you so much for giving us all this opportunity to talk to you. And there's lots of resources on the website, as Ben's uh, pointed out and has been shared in the chat. And thank you for all sharing your experiences as well. Thanks, Robin. Um, that was really fascinating. And again, a whistle stop tour of a lot of the research that we've been doing. So please do look at the resources for um, further insights into any of those areas. Um, and thank you for the questions. We will answer one or two of those live at the end. But I'm now going to hand over to uh, Anne Tarajani. Uh, so Anne is the CEO of the Audience Agency, which is uh, basically the UK's uh, agency, sector support organisation, supporting evidence and research into everything that audiences do and the tickets they buy, etc. cetera. Um, and in her spare time is also the co-director of the Centre for Cultural Value. So without further ado, over to you, Anne, to share some thoughts on the future of placemaking. Uh, thank you very much indeed. It, my spare time is the right word, exactly. So, um, I, in fact, my, the, I should probably reverse the way around. I, I, I build myself there. Uh, yes, and, and I'll just add to my colleagues' uh, thoughts to say thanks very much um, for joining us. It's some, uh, lovely to see some colleagues and some, uh, some new people to have a chat with um, here this evening. So, um, so, I'm just going to, as I promised you all in the chat, uh, to keep this fairly uh, snappy not least because I'm really talking about a future chapter of the Centre for Cultural Values work. Um, we have not come onto our work, as Ben was showing you, uh, as yet around uh, communities, placemaking and creativity. 
and I'm personally am really glad that it is actually the last chapter that we'll be um, coming on to as a theme in our current funding round, partly because it is a very knotty, complicated area, I think, I and mean, there's great riches there in terms of research and knowledge of understanding and differences of opinion and view, but it's also, um, I think, a really complex area, and uh, Robin's just done a brilliant job of explaining why uh, just the area of arts and health is really complicated and when we come on to placemaking we've got all sorts of issues around definitions of what we actually mean by it, who's involved with it and so on. So um, I'm going to attempt in a very crude non-academic way to um, give you a personal view of what I think, uh, why, why the future of placemaking, uh, it is important for us to understand cultural value in the context of placemaking. So I'm going to have a quick go at that. Let's see, is this working? Hmm, I think it is. Yes. So, um, as I think has been playing from both Robin and Ben's uh, presentations, we often start this the, with this question of whose cultural value we're actually talking about. And of course, when we talk about you know, the value that we bring to people's lives, we might often think firstly and foremostly about participants, as Robin was just talking about, about consumers, perhaps, we want to frame them in that way, makers, people involved with creativity themselves, professionals. We don't necessarily always think of um, the ways in which we Oops, can we go back one? The ways in which we um, uh, get take value from culture in these other aspects of our lives. So, you know, whether that's about being a citizen, how does culture improve the places in which we live, where we navigate them, we, whether we take meaning from them? How does it make where we live feel like a better place? How does it improve um, just the, 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 the our sort of everyday on, on the street living, as it were? Um, how does it help us to choose where we choose to go in our holidays or the visits we choose to make? How does it help us to connect better with our communities? How does it uh, change how we earn our money and how much money we earn and so on? And how does it help us if we're public servants to bring public benefit? Uh, um, public benefit? So these questions of, um, you know, this, these other forms of cultural value that we can receive as citizens and residents and so on, these are all deeply connected, it seems to me, with the idea of placemaking and the kinds of different kinds of value that are involved there. So as I say, very complex, rich territory in that sense. Um, what do we actually mean by culture-led placemaking? Um, I think this is quite an interesting question. As I said, there, there are as many different definitions as there probably are uh, placemaking cultural culture-led placemaking projects around the country at the moment. And if there is, it seems like there are a lot now, believe me, there are going to be a whole lot more um, uh, in the near future. And I think we can see that this will be one of the major ways that people are investing in the arts and culture. It's also one of the major ways that um, we're seeing money coming back into regenerating communities and so on. So there are going to be more, uh, and there are lots of these kinds of definitions. So here's what the lovely local, go oh, whoops, got to go back again. It's very, very, very trigger happy, this, uh, all my jokes and other sort of salient bits of information are coming. Can, I, can we go back at all? Ah, oh, lovely, thank you very much. Uh, so here's a here's a definition from uh, the local government association, from local government association that they came up with last year. Then they say there's now a clear acknowledgement of the social and economic value of the cultural sector and its ability to deliver growth and drive regeneration. So quite a lot of emphasis there you'll see on economic impact. Uh, and again, depending on who the stakeholders are, the economic or the social impacts will be in the ascendance. And they say these impacts can range from growth in tourism, creative and cultural sectors, enhancing individual skills, knowledge and confidence, to strengthening community pride and, and, and place image. So there's something really interesting here. These are these very sort of quite transactional, quite economic kind of drivers. But I do think there's a much broader uh, range of interests and much broader range of stakeholders. And one of the ways I just like to summarize it in a very quick way is thinking about all these C's. I'll come back to the C's, let me back. Oops, here they are. So I like this idea of congregation, um, you know, as our high streets are changing the nature of uh, what we go to our high streets for. Do we still need places for congregation to come together and make connections between people? And I think that's about, you know, every, just uh, uh, um, the part to do with being part of a community as well as, of course, the uh, connections that we make in a, in a so-called agglomerated um, uh, ecology as well, you know, where we're actually uh, sort of, where we're working together with other people and collaborating and so on. But also this idea of what community actually means. I mean, in fact, you know, I think there's a question about whether culture-led placemaking, where we can all be together, is actually sort of more meaningful than some of the other ways uh, that, than, than we've seen those things happening recently. So congregation, connections, community, 
the notion of commercial commerce and I think you'll see lots of stuff in the literature around placemaking around uh, so-called inclusive or sustainable growth and I think that I'm right in saying that I think Leeds actually talks about considerate growth somebody can correct me I see there's lots of uh, Yorkshire-based folk um, on this call but I think this notion of, of um, growth that is, is uh, people-centered and not just financially centered is a, is a really core key idea here as well but I also think there's something really fundamental about the notions of celebration and the fact that actually if anyone's good at celebration it is the, the cultural sector so if we think about different kinds of placemaking it seems to me that, cult that, that uh, cultural placemaking in particular brings some very particular benefits to it. Um, as I say I think this is really interesting as much as uh, there have been uh, you know down many many placemaking isn't a new thing at all um, you know if we think about uh, we may be living in a secular age now but once upon a time maybe it was a religion that brought people together and uh, created a sense of place um, Recently, you know, it seems that we have been all bowing down to the great uh, shopping god, uh, and uh, it has been shopping malls and so on that have, have led a lot of regeneration and the sort of sense of identity in place uh, in, our, in our big and small cities. Um, but I think there is a, a genuine interest everywhere, and it's, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of discussion, literature and, and uh, research around this idea at the moment that perhaps um, these ideas of creativity and culture are the future of placemaking. So I think it's a very exciting time, and it feels to me that this is one of the reasons it's so important we have a really robust and cross-project approach to the research and the evidence base. So uh, what are we talking about here? So I think there's this question about um, whether or not cultural institutions and practitioners bring something new and unique to the idea of placemaking. So I think we've made the argument quite often that there are some particular factors about the way that cultural practitioners and institutions work that make us particularly um, uh, that we bring something very particular to the table, if you like. So first, firstly, that many cultural institutions are all, already have a social civic purpose embedded in the way that they work. And I think we'd argue that um, they may be the kinds of organisations most suited to this way of working. Um, you'll see that quote from Wayne, Wayne Hemingway there um, stating what all the placemaking specialists all talk about, the fact that, um, you know, the, the notion of uh, playing the any town card is really dangerous. Uh, placemaking is all about individuality and distinctiveness, but of course it's very easy to come up with some sort of uh, blueprint for creativity and distinctiveness, which starts to mean that every, every, every cultural quarter looks like every other cultural quarter. So I think there's something about working with creative practitioners, which um, is really important in terms of the freshness and distinctiveness of those kinds of offers. I think that many creative practitioners are fantastically good at working in a very collaborative, multilingual, multilingual way, able to talk to many different parts of a, of a community and bring them together. Honest brokers in the sense that, um, you know, it isn't the commercial drivers primarily that necessarily motivate people and so on. I will also say that creative practitioners are super good and talented at human-centered design, whether they recognize that as such or, or not, and by which, and, and I particularly mean there, the, the idea that we work with our communities rather than to them, and that's very much embedded in, particularly in great community arts practice. So again, I think these are all important things to bring to the placemaking table. Uh, they're, they're, you said, uh, it, is, it is in people's DNA to work in a highly um, participatory and, uh, and indeed co-creative way. And I think we have a long track record in building local pride. When we ask um, uh, uh, audiences and people all over the country, what is it that they associate with their local place? It is often their cultural institutions and their cultural icons that they talk about, about actually being the, the kind of the, the, the markers and the symbols of local pride and identity. So we have a lot to offer here. And I think we obviously need to um, get inside understanding what it is that's special about what the culture offer brings in this, this notion of, of placemaking, which is which really needs to impact on the way we think about our sort of policy and practice, because otherwise there is a danger that we end up with some sort of kind of identity kit notions. Um, one of the biggest areas, of course, that we've seen um, lots of, um, so I'm gonna try and go back there again so you can see, oops, oh no, it's very, it's very fast. Uh, there we go. And um, so one of the, the, the uh, you know, w one of the biggest areas where we've seen, um, I think people often associate with cultural placemaking are these what, what, are, what are now often called hallmark events or these kind of these sort of mega cultural events uh, that, that, you know, taking up a, a lot of, you know, lots of resources going into um, huge amounts of interest and attention afforded to um, uh, cultural activities, you know, we've seen lots of examples of this really putting a spotlight on culture and its benefits. 
Um, I mean, obviously, there's a, again, a long history here, just going back to the past, the, the Festival of Britain, was it the first, who knows? Um, I think you could, you could probably say that, that uh, the Colosseum was the first, who knows? But, um, but you know, the, this idea, and then, of course, that we, we're in the middle of a, a city of culture in Coventry. These events are getting bigger and more noticeable as time goes on. And very exciting, of course, we're looking forward to 2023. Uh, this is Leeds uh, doing its response to the European Capital of Culture saying, well, look, if we're not allowed to do it, let's do it anyway, in a very sort of bold move. But I've um, called, I've sort of asked these questions about myth, mirage and miracle, really, because I think there are the claims made about potentially sort of event-based approach to placemaking um, are great. There's a huge pressure on, and again, I think there's a real need for a very meaningful and sensitive form of evaluation that helps us to understand what's going on here. And I think this, uh, this quote from the, sorry, this quote from, um, the evaluation of uh, Hull City, the, the, the City of Culture in 2017 is really interesting. Change has been profound, but somewhat fragile. And this, uh, this idea that you, we've got to be really sensitive to place and the way we understand how things have landed is really important because I think there is a big drivers um, of public investment and around in the policy frames to think about just kind of slapping lots of money into these things without perhaps the sort of um, nuanced understanding about what is really making a difference and what has legacy, what actually lasts. I like this idea of a profound but somewhat fragile, seems to me it makes a lot of sense. All of which takes us on to what it is that the Centre for Cultural Value can bring to the subject of placemaking. So as I've said, it's a massive, newly important new area of investment. Billions of public funds are going to go into placemaking. We, of course, want to see, I, of course, want to see um, culture sitting at that table. But I think we want to um, be able to have a nuanced and uh, you know, an, a conversation about it, an understanding of what's going on, which is based on really robust evidence. Ben mentioned that as a centre, we are on a mission to prioritise learning over advocacy in, the term, in, in terms of how we do evaluation and how we think about research. Um, this seems to me that there's an area where this is going to be particularly important. Uh, we know that a lot of these, particularly these very high profile events, you know, they, we have to confront this syndrome of things that they're just too important, too uh, heavily invested in to fail, that we, you know, it is very difficult to learn lessons for things where everything must be um, relentlessly upbeat in our way that we see that, uh, you know, the, the way that we, we evaluate and, and, and take lessons away from them. Um, I think again, uh, you know, Robin's given you an idea about how deep some of our um, thinking around uh, cultural value is going. Um, I think there was a big temptation, as you saw from that LGA quote there, to oversimplify what cultural value might mean in the, in, in the um, frame of case making. So I think this connection with the rest of our work is going to be super important. Of course, we are one step away. Perhaps we can um, we can explore the political dimension uh, in some of our work here as well, which also feels very importantly. And as as Ben also showed, we've got a really fantastic new community of evaluators coming together around the centre. So I think it's going to be a fantastic place that we are going to be able to share these kind of ideas of this complex form of placemaking. So, looking forward to having those broader conversations. Um, we know that this is all about uh, placemaking is together creating things and making things happen across many sectors, uh, putting culture right in the centre of bringing uh, many agencies together to, to make our lives better. So question is how? Um, we've got a job to do there in uh, kind of creating that evidence base and helping uh, the, the well and, and, and broadly thinking about what placemaking may mean to society and making more livable places. So um, I invite you to watch this space. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Anne. That was absolutely fascinating. I really like that that five C model, the idea of you know congregation and celebration, and I think it's compassionate growth that uh, compassionate Judith Blake. Growth. Judith you. Blake, it was. Who was much the, much better. Thank you, compassionate growth. Leader of the city council to talk about. It's a really interesting concept, isn't it? <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, really, uh, and thank you for ending on a really positive note as well um, about you know the the really positive differences that culture can make if we get it right. Um, and this idea that there isn't necessarily a blueprint, but it's all contextual. So apologies, we've overrun a little bit. We started a bit late and we, we struggled to get all of that information in, in in our allotted 30 minutes. So we are very happy to stay till 10 past seven. Um, obviously, people who need to leave earlier, please do. But we, we will be here till 10 past seven. So please continue to post questions uh, in the Q&A and we will pick up on those. But I'm going to start with a question because it uh, leads on beautifully from Anne's presentation. 
that was posted by uh, Laura from the, all the way from Zimbabwe, which is somewhat I really want to go. So I'm totally biased in, in privileging this question. But Laura asked, Anne, um, how can small cities leverage placemaking? Which is a great question, isn't it? Because a lot of the, of the research and the noise, certainly people like Richard Florida, around placemaking is about the city, the kind of what's been called, you know, fetishization of the city and cultural quarters, examples like Bilbao and the Guggenheim, etc. So what, you know, what's, what's in this for small cities? It's a really interesting question. So I, I don't have the answer. I think there's some, probably some of our panelists um, have got some really interesting things to say about this as well. But I, some of the stuff that I've been most interested in is, are, are the, is the work that's been happening in um, Britain's coastal towns, you know, those places where actually that it feels as though what they used to be good at, you know, sticks of rock and kiss me quick and all that st stuff has sort of, it, it's just faded away and they're left wondering what it is they can, you know, what, what do they do next? And I think this idea that you find something that is rooted in your past, but is distinctively about your future and you do something that's quirky and interesting is actually, you know, one of the most interesting uh, responses to that. So I think we've seen lots of, actually the one, the, the one I really, I, the, the place I really like, I was going to talk a little bit about is, is um, not, a, well, not really a, a, a kiss me quick place, but, you know, the mighty red car. You just think about how they've, you know, they started off doing some really interesting things like their festival of thrift and kind of, kind of creative ideas that played with, um, the identity of red car is this kind of rather forgotten place that had an interesting industrial history and actually where you know the collapse of everything was sort of what was what was what was giving it its current identity and then they had that amazing documentary that was kind of all about sort of this very nuanced true to true to itself kind of idea of place and i think those it is you know, I, I mean, I, I know it's a bit of a cliche, Wayne Hemingway's idea of, of um, don't don't be in any town, but I think it's absolutely right. It's all about being distinctive and true to yourself. And I think there is something about that honesty, which is both good for local pride, but also brings some of those um, those attractive benefits, you know, they're just the things about people being paid properly. Yeah, and you, you talked about um, Coventry and Hull as cities of culture, and it seems there might be a move away from one city of culture to, to several, and certainly maybe from the bigger cities to some of the smaller cities as well. And certainly in West Yorkshire, those of you still based here or who visit revisit regularly Leeds, uh, our new Metro Mayor Tracy Braben is very interested in, you know, looking at the peripheral towns around Leeds, particularly, or the big cities and how you know, in the past, those big cities can suck out the resources and, and all of the money for cultural investment. So I think there is a bit of redressing the balance going on. So it's maybe, it's maybe quite an exciting time, I think, for smaller cities and towns, isn't it? Uh, Robin, I've got a question for you from Rajhav from India, um, who asks, how does music help in resolving tensions at home during COVID? Do we, do we have any evidence that music maybe did play a positive role? Uh, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I think it's not something that, because we review secondary, uh, we review research rather than doing primary research, it's not something that we've directly addressed um, ourselves. Um, but music more generally has been seen to obviously facilitate that sense of connection with other people to relieve stress. So I would more than assume that it would be complementary in a situation like that. Um, it's worth noting that Daisy Fancourt at UCL has been doing some research that looks at arts and cultural engagement throughout the pandemic that is kind of trickling into the public realm at the moment. If that's something that you're interested in, I would definitely um, check out her work. Thanks, Robin. And Anne, I mean, we've we've obviously been, or you've really been leading a survey, population survey in the UK about what people did and how they engaged with culture during the pandemic. Is is that is music something in specific that we've touched on in the survey? Well, it seems, uh, I think that um, one of the things that we've noticed is that uh, there's been this, well, one of the things I think is most interesting is the idea that less that people have suddenly taken up doing new things, but that people have had time to do the things that they had a passing interest in. So, and that's been across the board. So whatever your thing was for beforehand, um, you've just had a chance to do more of it and get, and, and to reconnect your passion for it, you know? So, so this, so it seemed a, a sort of a tenuous connection with something suddenly became a great passion again. So we haven't seen, I mean, the, the, the monitors, because we asked people a lot about what they were doing before, what they're doing now, and what they think they're going to do next, which has been really interesting interesting so I think the perception may have been that people were suddenly having a go at things for the first time and the evidence points in a slightly different direction it's more about you know the arguments about 
proper time and time for ourselves and our own creativity, which I think again is going to be a really interesting subject for the future, actually. Yeah, it's, it's part of the whole working from home debate, isn't it? And, you know, life becoming more hyper-local, um, people having more time, cutting out that commute, obviously. Um, it, it's absolutely fascinating. And I think some of the stories that you all shared earlier uh, absolutely demonstrated how, you know, arts and culture, music in one case, I think, did make a positive difference to, to your well-being. And that idea of sharing, certainly in the UK, there were moments, weren't there, around, say, normal people that was... Um, became cult and everyone sharing uh, on social media and uh, various kind of uh, crime thrillers that kept people wrapped during those difficult days in March and April. So thanks for that question. Uh, we have a, a fascinating question, one that um, always interests me when I'm teaching arts management. I'm going to uh, give to you, Anne, which is from Casey, who asked, is it ever too late to break into the business of culture? <laughs> Is it too late to break out? That's what I want. <laughs> uh, uh, no, of course not. I mean, you know, I, I, I think, it, I think it, Casey, I'd love to know exactly what you mean by the business of culture, but I, I, I guess not. I mean, and I mean, I think actually we are, we do. One of the concerns I have, and I, I can probably share this with, with, with you, Ben, because you know, we, we work a lot, you know, pretending we know stuff and sharing it with other people, um, and doing a lot of uh, social skills development and so on. But I think, you know, one of the things we really notice is that we, we exist in such a bubble. So I'm actually really encouraging of people that haven't either worked for a while in the cultural sector or have never done so bringing their expertise and their sort of um you know privileged outside outside of you to the way we do things in a, in the cultural sector so if, if that's what you meant casey get on with it come on in give me on oh, give me a job there we go that's it great thank you um Okay, I'm gonna. We've got a live question here from Sarah, probably one for you, Robin, who says, uh, "I'm very interested in the connection between creative activities encouraging laughter and humour for participants, for our organisation through drama in particular, and its impact on health and well-being. Is this an area the centre is looking into at the moment?" Well, laughter and humour is something that comes up in a lot of the literature that's out there. Um, and so it's not not an outcome that we kind of specifically look at because our kind of research or review questions are a bit broader than that so that we can look as much research as possible. But it is something that I very much saw within my PhD research, um, the way in which um, people living with dementia were able to use musical instruments to create comedy and humour, which is something that you just is not really reported in the literature, but people are having um, sword fights with drumsticks and the sort of musicians would support those interactions by creating these really sort of ominous and serious musical backings, which because of the context just made it really funny and I think it is something that's just so important and it comes back to this idea of what is seen as valuable is it some is it that someone's depression score has decreased or that they've laughed for the first time in months so yeah I think it's a valuable outcome it's just how we capture that yeah absolutely uh, we've got a question from Yvonne about can we connect uh, with the Institute for Transport Studies? Absolutely. I'm fascinated in this. Dissertations on transport and art. It's certainly not something I know very much about. I don't know if either of you, Robin or Anne, have anything to add on the relationship between transport yeah. and art? I mean, something that comes up all the time is we're currently doing a review on older people's cultural participation. And time and time again, people say that one of the biggest barriers to cultural participation for older people is transport and actually getting to cultural venues, cultural spaces, um, and actually how digital has opened up opportunities for access because people don't have to get on transport to attend. Um, so I think that's an area that's um, yeah coming out strongly and in conversations with people about barriers to access. So I think that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, and I'd, I, I'd say that you know it's a it's a, often a little known fact that where you live and how easily you can access uh, the so-called what I would like to think about the sort of the culture grid is the single fact that has the most impact on how much and what kind of uh, culture and, and stuff you, and, and creative engagement you're able to do. So, you know, you forget levels of education or how much you earn or, you know, whether or not you've got 16 PhDs in creative practice. 
where you live and, and whether or not, you know, if you live 45 minutes away, more than 45 minutes away from stuff, you won't be doing it. So there's a, there's a huge link between, you know, we spend a lot of time doing mapping. So if you've got mappy data and that's what you're talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm dead interested, come this way, I think. <laughs> so, you know, so I think and there's, there's something here, isn't there as well about devolution. It's not, it's not a coincidence. I think that Andy Burnham and Tracy Brabin and, you know, Manchester and Leeds are looking at cheap transport and resting back control from the government. So we can actually get people to cultural venues as well from, um, you know, more deprived areas of the cities. Um, okay, a quick question we can answer very quickly from Natalie, who says, are we engaging with social prescribing agenda? Absolutely. Uh, Robin has written a brilliant digest of that. Um, Kathleen may be able to post a link in the chat. If not, uh, please look on our website and you'll be able to find it there. Um, I guess in a, in a nutshell, there's very, very little academic research on social prescribing. And um, Robin, is there anything else you want to add in terms of the key findings? Um, I think the easiest thing is to go and have a look at the, the research digest, but just to note that we are having conversations with the National Academy for Social Prescribing, as well as the National Centre for Creative Health, who are um, working very strongly in this area. So we can feed in what we know from academic literature to what they know from, from practice. What's, what's really missing, I think I, what shocked me, I don't think there are any academic studies and hardly any studies on the role of link workers, you know, so, so there's very little understanding of the process and also of the, of the business model, you know, who pays for this stuff, it, it can often be seen to be a bit of a cheap way of doing health, um, but you know, very difficult for cultural organisations to, to fund this long term. Okay, let's shift our thinking towards leadership. Susie's asked a question. Um, do you think the pandemic has revealed where the holes are in cultural leadership? What a great question. Where cultural providers at the margins have been very responsive to their communities while all the big players went underground. Anne, I'm gonna uh, give you that challenging question. Go on, I really, uh, no, I'm, I'm glad to have it. Although I, then I'm, I am going to bounce it back to you because I think you've really been, you know, this has been your, your, you know, your subject all through this. But, but I think, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've heard, I mean, I've definitely heard people talking about doing amazing things, being, you know, people who were already very embedded in their community, just being, you know, I think actually realizing how important they were, which was probably good for their confidence and, you know, and it's sort of a, uh, a, a and, and, and spurred them on to greater things. And then it's just, I remember listening to this company, a, a, a Yorkshire based company actually, who were doing this astonishing pro, um, um, refugee pro, uh, um, project. And they took the whole thing on WhatsApp and had the biggest response they'd ever had, but also kind of people clinging on to this project as a way of sort of building community in really, really interesting ways. So I think that is true. But I also think the big institutions, you know, having spoken to quite a lot of big institutions, they have, I think they found new purpose and depth in, you know, often doing things in their local communities they wouldn't otherwise have done and being quite imaginative. So I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that the big institutions have, have all done that, but I think, I think plenty of them have used it as an opportunity to rethink, but they have had, you know, the massive stress of the huge financial pressures on them and, you know, 200 people about to lose their jobs, it puts you in a slightly different place, isn't it? But I, but I, but I think, I think a lot of them have, I'm sorry, I don't sound too Pollyanna, it's all marvellous everywhere, but, you know, I think, I think I've seen lots of people being really inventive about, about being useful and I think the appetite to, to be of civic value has increased hugely. That's that's really anecdotal, but I have a real sense that that's happened. Ben, you, you've 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 done a lot in, with with you've talked to a lot of people. You're you're sitting all over the interviews. What's what's your sense? Yeah, we we've seen absolutely a kind of pivot towards civic engagement um, from large galleries and theatres. Um, I think uh, a real increased kind of awareness of the need to be relevant to communities now. Um, I mean, some people are talking about useful arts and Manchester Art Gallery and the, and the Whitworth in particular are talking about this, which is a, a, a difficult concept, isn't it? I mean, you know, in Leeds, of course, there have been stories like Slung Low of, you know, using the logistical expertise to, to set up food banks overnight and doing something very kind of pragmatic for their community. So, I mean, I'd agree, Anne, it, it's, it was easy, wasn't it, for small organisations to pivot very quickly and flexibly, but the larger ones were dealing with furlough and you know having very poor kind of HR resources and dealing with all with redundancies 
But I think, you know, although a lot of them have absolutely, uh, I mean, someone actually used the Opera North example of the community choir, which is Genius lovely. Genius story, by the way. Look yeah, there were some yeah. great, you know, really creative stories. What we're also seeing is some larger organisations, I think mainly museums, have laid off their outreach and education staff. So th there's an element of talking the talk, but actually not, you know, not putting their money where their mouth is in terms of this new business model or these new missions that are, do seem to be more socially engaged, but yeah, it's a mixed picture, I think, for for valid yeah. reasons. But certainly, the, the 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 data is telling us, isn't it, Ben, that the that actually, if you were already um, disadvantaged in terms of cultural engagement uh, through the pandemic, you will have become more disadvantaged, you know, yeah. or, or or at least you know that, that people who already you know that even even fewer people who were coming from disadvantaged backgrounds were engaging in what little stuff there was around to do. So I think you know there's no doubt that the the divide has been has been wide and despite the valiant efforts of individual organizations it hasn't made an overall positive impact on on society uh, you know at large. So. Yeah and sadly a lot of the funding has gone to areas that were already very well funded. So you know the biggest recipient relatively is Greater Manchester because they've got the biggest number of you know core funded organizations so it is as ever I guess with a pandemic it has kind of exacerbated um, existing inequalities which is really problematic and going to be harder to rebuild from isn't it. Uh, Robin there's a question here from um, Mabeth Davies around arts and health for um, you know arguing that there's more available for under 24 and over 55 but very little for those of working age who aren't in work. Is that, have you got any, any reflections on that? Yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting how in the kind of world of arts and health, we kind of put people into little boxes, depending on what we think will, will help, um, help the most. I mean, the, the vast majority of, of things that I read are either younger people or people over kind of over 55. Um, and there is less research on that kind of working age group. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's very important that we we consider um, both the kind of lifelong experiences and how that relates to our health and well being, um, but also developing um, specific programs for different communities within this within this route within this group. It's such a wide age bracket. I know, for example, that Breathe Arts Health Research have a specific um, program for. Um, uh, mums experiencing um, postnatal depression and things like that so th I think the more specific your program can be for addressing a specific health or well-being need and you can define who that population is will just encourage more and more evidence to to come out of it rather than this kind of scattergun approach. Great right, and a follow-up question Robin on autism from uh, Patsy apologies if I've not uh, pronounced that correctly um, so, yeah, uh, I work with young people with autism and I'm interested in how participation in the arts and specifically music shapes the development of an identity and a sense of context and belonging for people with autism. What are your thoughts on that and how we report this to stakeholders? Yeah, what, what a great question. And interestingly, before coming into the worlds of arts and health, I was in the field of um, autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. So. Um, it's a question that that really resonates with a lot of the work that I've been doing. Um, in terms of specific literature, it's not something that I have directly explored myself, but I have um, worked on Manchester Camerata's Songlines project, which I'm not sure is still happening at the moment, but it's an initiative that brings together young people with autism with their peers to create um, a production that brings together music, drama and creative visual arts. And from that kind of evaluation that I was involved with, it was very much to do with this idea of feeling connected to other people um, through arts and culture. So I think it's an area that's probably underexplored and there may be more in the kind of creative arts therapy realm on this topic area, but it's something that I would expect to, to come out in the literature if, we, if there was a review to be done in this area. Thank you. OK, we've got time for probably a couple of a couple more questions. So I'm going to pick one from those submitted uh, in advance and then I've got one to finish on. So uh, I'm going to go for um, a question from Tracy from Hong Kong. Let's keep it nice and global. So uh, Tracy asked, in an ever digitalized world, 
how are art museums or oh, medium sorry art mediums changing to increase engagement and maintain the value in the arts um and i'm going to start with you on that one it's a really good question isn't it because i think i think um again i don't want to be too sort of pandemic obsessed but i do think that the pandemic as we've said is has this sort of exacerbating or accelerating effect and i would say that you know we've been aware for quite a long time that a next generation of cultural consumers and participants um, and the grey area in between those two things is, is much more interested in um, much more interactive kind of experiences because actually that's what, you know, in a world in which you interact with your screen all the time and you expect to be a protagonist in a different way, we've known that, you know, actually those kinds of more traditional art forms, which are very fourth wall, um, are, are not getting much traction. So I think this idea that more immersive, digitally enabled, more immersive creative experiences, we've known for a while that that needs to be where there needs to be plenty of R&D and public support for that kind of working. And I think that there have been people saying that and they were sort of, they, they, were, they were slightly on the fringes and it was kind of, it was, it was more, it's like, well, that's a commercial thing that has nothing to do with, you know, traditional arts and culture and so on. And I think that I think that narrative is really changing. Am I, am I, make, am I making sense there in, in, in that? In that, So I, th I think there will be a much greater interest. Uh, we've seen, you know, one of the things we've seen with this kind of very high levels of digital, digital engagement, which skews very, very, very much towards younger audiences. And the evidence is all telling us that actually what people like is let, you know, there, there, there is an appetite among that younger audience and a big one, probably unmet for high quality creative experiences which are immersive, interactive, and, and some, somewhat different from what we've seen now. And it feels as though that's where we need to be enabling artists to be working in that space rather than but as much as in more traditional ways. Yeah, and, and I'd say, you know, certainly from the interviews we've done with organisations, it, it really is about understanding engagement first before digital. Digital isn't a solution, is it? It's a means to an end. What's important, of course, is building relationship with cultural participants, with audiences, and how digital can be used effectively to do that, rather than just investing in, in digital for the sake of digital. And, and the idea that dialogue and interaction and iterative, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that you are part of something together and that that relationship is slightly changed, I think is really key to it in some way. You know, so. Yeah, it's, it's those C's, isn't it? It's that congregation, community building in a, in a you know, in the uh, digital space. Digital space yeah. So a uh, final question for both of you is, because uh, we're up to time now, 10 past seven, uh, is if you had a magic wand in your respective areas, so Anne thinking about cultural and placemaking or regeneration and, and Robin thinking about cultural health wellbeing, what would what would you wish for in those areas of research or practice, whichever springs to mind? Um, I think for me, it's about um, developing new new ways of understanding these experiences. Um, so the the magic wand waving would create a whole body of really creative, innovative researchers who are ready to address uh, this issue. Um, and just to add as well, just going back to the digital question, um, we are doing a whole podcast episode on this uh, particular question, which we released in January. But yeah, there's my magic magic wand moment. Super. Thank you very much, Robin and Anne. Yeah, I think I, it would be something like having more resources available to do the kind of evaluation where we get to hear not just, you know, that it, about the, the evaluation itself, uh, the research measures, but with the way we understand impact is co-designed with uh, participants and communities for whom they're intended. Now, we, we talk about that kind of practice a lot, but then quite often, you know, we are commissioned to do a lot of that work. When it actually comes to doing it, there isn't quite, it, it, you know, it's, it's quite resource heavy. Uh, you know, it takes time, it's, it goes backwards and forwards. Um, and I think sometimes we need to cut corners at the last minute and come up with a few whizzy metrics that sort of do the job. So uh, I, what, my magic one would be to kind of create a pot for, um, uh, to, for kind of uh, experimentation, I don't know, to kind of subsidise or encourage that kind of really um, democratically driven ideas of, of measuring quality or at least capturing ideas of quality so that we can, you know, that's the only way I think that agenda is going to change. Superb. On that positive note, again, I just want to thank you both very much for being on the panel and for your respective presentations. Clearly engaged uh, the audience, which is wonderful with lots of great questions. So thank you very much.
Thanks to you. Thank, thank you, audience. Lovely to meet you all, kind of. Right. Yes. And we've just got a couple of slides to close on. I'd just like to remind people again to um, fill in the feedback form, which should magically appear on your screens uh, before you leave, please. I think the alumni team would be really grateful to hear uh, your views on the webinar and future plans for webinars. Um, and we, we have a request for you, which is to, we're, we're engaged in uh, the development of an online platform called Yarn, where we're trying to, a bit like Robin did earlier, trying to capture stories of what people were doing during COVID, your creative and cultural stories. So if you're interested in sharing your story in a little bit more detail than we gave you time to earlier, please do uh, log on to valueinculture.community uh, and leave a reflection on uh, what you were doing culturally during the pandemic. Um, that's all from me. I just want to say again, thank you so much for listening to us, for asking us such really uh, challenging and interesting questions about the role of culture and arts in society. Please do keep in touch. Please sign up to our mailing list. Uh, I promise we won't inundate you. Um, we won't abuse our, our power of the database. We will send you timely communications, but it's been a real pleasure talking to you this evening and um, I hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much.